special time of celebrating the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord. Our annual state meeting will be held April 17th through the 20th at the Winfrey Hotel in Birmingham. See Brother Tim for more info. Good morning, church. Happy Resurrection Sunday. Can we stand together and let's worship our Lord this morning? Who gets the glory and praise? Nobody knows. 
There's a reason why the curse of sin is broken. There's a reason why the darkness runs from light. There's a reason why we stand here now forgiven. Jesus is alive. There's a reason why we are not overtaken. There's a reason why we sing all through the night. There's a reason why our hope remains eternal. Jesus is alive. Everybody sing. Praise the King. alive. Amen. Christos on viats, adeverat on viats. Amen. You speak Romanian, right? So good to see you on the Lord's Day. And this is a special Sunday, Easter Sunday. Our choir is coming and they're, uh, they're getting in place. And so I'm going to stretch it out just a little bit. Uh, we're going to worship the Lord through giving here in just a moment. And uh, we're so glad you're here and uh, delighted to have you with us as we worship the Lord on this Easter Sunday. And uh, uh, I'm going to ask our ushers, if you will, to make your way. Let me give you just a little bit of instruction. Um, we won't have enough ushers to be at the end of every row, and so when it gets to the end of your row, just pass it to the row behind you, uh, and they'll, they'll, they'll know what to do with it from there. 
but uh, help these guys out. Look how pitiful they look and they are, amen? And so help them out. And, uh, uh, but we're looking forward to what, uh, what God is going to do in this service. Wasn't that some good singing already? And uh, looking forward to what, what God has in store. Let's go ahead and pray together. Ask God to bless this offering. And uh, I'm going uh, to ask Brother Jesse, if you will, lead us in prayer, please. such a mystery the God of all eternity the one whose voice had thunder let there be would wrap himself in flesh who can know or ever understand the wonder of the Father's plan the one who breathed the breath Drawing his first breath. So that we could live, born to die. So that death would never win. Born to take the chains of sin and leave them broken in the grave. Born to live. to earth and they shout the glory of his birth as shepherds make their way to be the first to witness God's own son see the virgin cradling her child a bitter sadness in her smile she holds him close remembering all the
I saw Jesus crucified. I spoke to him as he died. I saw him in his struggle. I watched as he breathed his last breath and when he stopped breathing, I lost my breath too. The one who walked on water is no more. The one who fed 5,000 is now food for the worms and if he has been defeated, what does that mean for me? I thought that he would be the king who would rise up and rule our nation. I thought that we were the ones to bring truth and revelation, but it turns out we were wrong. I mean, maybe we imagined this all along. As I watched his body taken down from the cross, I saw my friend was gone. and He was the one who found me. How could this be? He must have gone before his time. It must have been too soon. It must have been an illusion or a dream. He can't be in a tomb. I can't come to grips with the thought that the man who claimed to be I am was slain by the hands of men. And then she burst through the door. Our friend Mary, she said, someone had taken the body of the Lord. So we ran to the tomb, only to find an empty room. And the stone was rolled away looked on the floor and I saw his clothes and that's when I knew he rose Jesus is alive he did walk on water he did feed the 5,000 he did raise Lazarus from the dead and heal thousands he did make the wine he did talk to God he did pray for those who put him on the cross and he raised back to life just like Lazarus except for he would never die again Jesus took death nails in his hands nails in his feet a crown of thorns on his head for you He laid his life down and he took it back again. Jesus is alive.
could. Let's stand and let's worship together. How great the i 
is our God, and oh, we'll see how great, how great is our God. Sing it again. How great is our God. Sing with me how great. How great is our God. Amen. Well, good singing this morning. Amen. Isn't it good to sing praise unto the Lord and just worship Him? Now, since we have a good crowd here this morning, I thought it would just be fitting to see. John Cole, are you and Hannah still engaged? All right. well, and we actually announced that one Sunday when Hannah was here. You were working. and so, uh, but, but John Cole and Hannah are engaged. And, uh, isn't that great? John Cole, you want to come up and say anything? Or? <laughs> oh, isn't God good? Man, what a Savior. Take your Bibles, go to Luke 24. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 24. <clears throat> I love Easter. Everybody wears all their bright colored clothing. Amen. Chance, he did exceptionally well today. Did he not? Amen. Yeah. You even had Amy singing. Yeah. Good job. Luke chapter 24, Carson read this morning. He got down uh, through the first 11 verses. Pick up in verse 13. Same chapter, verse 13. It says, And behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem, about three score furlongs, about seven miles. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holden that they should not know him. And he said unto them, What manner of communications are these that you have one to another as you walk and are sad? Well, that's not one word we use in connection with Resurrection Sunday, is it? Not the word sad. And, the one, and one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering, said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? And he said unto them, What things? And they said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty in deed and word, before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulchre. And when they found not his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels which said that he was alive. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulcher and found that even so as the women had said, but him they saw not. Then he said unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. And they drew nigh unto the village whither they went. And he made as though he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them. And it came to pass, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and broke and gave to them. And their eyes were opened, and they knew him. And he vanished out of their sight. And they said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way 
and while he opened to us the scriptures, and they rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together and them that were with them, saying, The Lord is risen indeed and hath appeared to Simon. I want to share some thoughts entitled this morning, Will the real Jesus please stand up? Let's bow for prayer. Father, this morning we're grateful that we have these few moments, Lord, just to to come into your presence this morning. We're not intruding, Lord. You welcome us. You throw the door wide open. Lord, you invite us to come freely, fully into your presence. And, And Lord, we just come this morning asking you to to add your blessing to the reading of the Word. May your anointing be present for the preaching of the Word. Thank you, Lord, for uh, the, the, the thing we've already experienced in terms of being able to worship you, the, uh, the way we've been able to lift our voices, our hearts unto you. And, and Lord, I pray you'd reciprocate now. May you speak back unto us through the Word. Uh, Lord, you know us. You know what our needs are. Lord, all across this room this morning, there are folks that, that need to hear from you. Uh, Lord, some need to hear from you for perhaps the very first time. And God, I... I do pray you'd knock upon their heart's door, help them to know who you are and, Lord, what you did for them and, Lord, what you expect, what you anticipate from them. And I pray today, Lord, would be the day of redemption, the day of salvation, the resurrection would literally mean something unto them today. It'd be more than fact, but, Lord, it'd be something they embrace, something they put their faith in. And so may you draw them and speak to them and have your way in their life. I pray for your children. Uh, Lord, some that are, that are struggling right now, there are some that are discouraged, some that are going through some difficult things, some that are looking for answers, uh, Lord, some that uh, find themselves in the midst of trial and tribulation. And God, I, I do pray you draw near and meet their needs, be everything they need you to be today. You are the great I am, and I pray, Father, you'd move in a mighty way. Uh, Lord, just speak today. And, and I pray that as you speak, Lord, we'd find that all the answers we have need of, they're found in you. And so, Lord, help us to turn our hearts unto you. We give you this time, Lord. Use it for your glory, I pray. And we'll praise you for what you do. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Will the real Jesus please stand up? Today, billions of people around the world are celebrating Easter. Now now you realize we... We're on a different time scale based upon the, uh, the, the time change around the world. But it is interesting the different ways that people celebrate Easter in other places. Uh, There there are some unique traditions uh, that have evolved in other cultures. For example, if if you were in Jamaica today, and how many would like to be in in Jamaica this morning? Amen. Amen? Wouldn't it be good to be in Jamaica? And and if you were in Jamaica today, you would celebrate Easter in this sense. Uh, They they take eggs and they crack them, and, uh, and they do that on Good Friday, and they put the egg white in a glass of water, and they leave it set outside. And because it's a tropical climate and it gets a little bit warm, the, the egg white begins to, to move around in that water and it begins to form some, somewhat of a pattern. There's a, there's a shape under that, that egg white. And, uh, and they go out and look at it later on in the afternoon and, 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 and based upon the pattern of that egg white in the water, it determines when and how you're going to leave this world. So I thought it might be good to get some water and some eggs and just see when we're fixing to check out of here. Amen? By by the way, there is a website you can go to and and, and if you just punch in some data about yourself, it'll tell you when you're going to die. According to that that website, I've got four years, three days, 17 hours, 22 minutes, and 15 seconds. Amen? But but at any rate, uh, that's what they do in Jamaica. Could you imagine? Doesn't sound like the Easter we celebrate. In Germany, they decorate trees the way most folks decorate trees at Christmas. But they have an interesting law that is observed nationally. Do you, do you know that, that, that in, in, in Germany, you are not allowed to dance on Good Friday? Brother Ron, that would throw your celebration into a real tizzy, wouldn't it? Huh? No dancing on Good Friday. What in the world would we do? Makes sense, doesn't it? If you were in Hungary, and I don't mean if you are hungry, but if you were in the country of Hungary, uh, the women, they dress in, in traditional garb, traditional Easter garb, and, and uh, then they go out in public, and the men, and I do like this tradition, I think we ought to start this, the men dump buckets of water on the women when they're dressed in traditional garb. Joe, what do you think about that? 
Yeah. Don't say amen too loud. Yeah. In Sweden, in Finland, children dress up like witches and they go door to door and recite a blessing to the resident of the home on whose door they knock. And when they recite the blessing unto them, the people give them candy. We've already got something like that, amen? We call it Halloween, right? Hmm? What does that have to do with Easter? In Africa, and I like this, they have an Easter vigil that begins on Saturday evening. Everyone is sad, they're somber, uh, they walk around with the, with the poochy lip and, and, and there are tears that are shed. But when the sun rises, the mood changes and they begin singing and dancing and celebrating the resurrection of Christ. In Bermuda, in Bermuda people fly kites on Good Friday. And, and that tradition, it started uh, when a teacher was trying to, to share with his students the ascension of Jesus Christ. He's trying to get them to understand the concept of Jesus ascending back into heaven and they couldn't quite get it. And so he took a kite and he drew the, uh, the, the, the face of Jesus on the kite and he flew the kite and just let it soar up into the, into the clouds and it, it was sort of picturing for them how Jesus ascended into heaven. And so, so they do that in Bermuda on Good Friday. In Greece, they dye Easter eggs, but they're all dyed red. Because that red represents the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed for our sins. There's a town in France that makes an enormous omelet on the day after Easter. On Easter Monday. As a matter of fact, the townspeople, they will crack their eggs at home and bring, bring all those raw eggs together. And they come to the town square. There's a giant, enormous skillet that they cook it in. And they dump all of that in there. Some of the townsfolk, they stir it up. They'll use as many as 5,000 eggs and feed 1,000 people on Easter Monday. And they do that because uh, years prior to that, Napoleon had come through that specific town with his army and, uh, and, and they had fed him and his army. And so, uh, so they do that out of tradition. Some odd traditions, are they not, concerning Easter? Numerous other traditions. Some that seek to celebrate and honor Christ and, 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 and some that have nothing to do with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Easter is about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's not about springtime. It's not about colored eggs. It's not about new outfits. And it's not about our, our annual church attendance. Amen. It's about Jesus raising from the grave. It's about the Son of God who died for our sins, who, who raises up out of the grave, defeating death, subduing sin, offering life, to anybody who calls upon the name of the Lord. The resurrection of Jesus Christ has the power to become a, a life-altering, destiny-changing event for anybody who understands and believes and puts their faith in Jesus Christ. It's about transformation. It's about change. It's about going from, from death unto life. And not just what Jesus did, but He offers the same thing unto us. Because all of us are dead spiritually, but in Christ we can be alive spiritually in Him. And ultimately alive forevermore through Him. Now I want you to go back to the text and look in verse 13. Because I want you to see these, these two disciples. It says in verse 13, And behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus which was from Jerusalem, about three score furlongs. And so these two disciples of Jesus, and by the way, this is on Resurrection Day. This is on the, the first day of the week. Jesus has already resurrected from the grave. Uh, they have received, and you, you noted it as we read earlier, they've already received report that Jesus had resurrected from the women who went to the tomb and had received that angelic proclamation. But these guys on this day, they're, uh, they're, they're headed toward a village called Emmaus. And from their conversation, we know that they're headed from Jerusalem to Emmaus. And if you were to look on a map today, you would find that, that Emmaus is, is situated directly west from Jerusalem. Matter of fact, it's seven miles west of Jerusalem. The cross is back in Jerusalem. The tomb is back in Jerusalem. The other followers of Jesus, they're back in Jerusalem. But they have turned their back on Jerusalem and they're walking away toward Emmaus. They're walking away from all, of the, all that they put their faith in, all that they had trusted in, all that they had looked unto. And they're walking west toward Emmaus. And here's the reason why. Here's the reason why. They had put all their hope in Jesus and when He died... Their hope died with Him. 
You listening? They put all their trust, all of their faith, all of their hope in Jesus. And when Jesus died, their hope died with Jesus. When Jesus was buried, so was their hope. For them it was over. They were calling it quits. And they're walking away from following this man, this this God-man, Jesus Christ. But guess who shows up as they're walking away? Isn't it just like Jesus to show up on a dirt road in the middle of nowhere and meet up with some folks and begin to, to minister to two folks who were confused and hopeless and broken? And by the way, Jesus could have been anywhere at this specific moment, but He chose to be with a couple of folks who were wandering away. Imagine that, the good shepherd is going after wayward sheep. The rescuer is out rescuing the one who came not to, not to be ministered unto, but to minister. He's ministering. The one who came to be a ransom for all, he's, he's being a ransom for all. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. And so the resurrection, it, it radically changes these individuals. And by the way, it ought to do the same thing for us. And there's some elements, and I want to give you some quick thoughts this morning, but, but some elements about the resurrection that they needed to embrace. And you and I, we need to embrace those same elements as well. So let me share three quick thoughts with you about the resurrection. Number one, the resurrection is more than facts. Number one, it is more than facts. You say, preacher, what are you talking about? Well, look at verse 14. It says, and they talked together of all these things which had happened. Now, 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 by the way, it didn't say they talked about all these things that they thought had happened. They're talking about the facts of what had taken place in the last several days. They knew the facts. They had all the data. They knew what had happened. And yet in spite of what they knew, they are still walking away and giving up. Why? Can I tell you something? Facts alone never turn into faith. If you miss everything else I said, please get a hold of that. Facts alone never turn into faith. I'm telling you, there are folks all across this congregation. You've got the facts. And and, and by the way, not just about the resurrection. Isn't isn't it interesting, the culture we live in, Brother Doug and I, we were talking uh, before service, and and, and it's interesting how how, how folks will believe about anything, and it doesn't have to to more tie to anything. There's no need for logic or rationale or reason in our culture anymore. just, Just whatever comes up comes out. You know, didn't Pilate say, what is truth? Well, that's kind of where we live today, isn't it? Yeah. I, I, I mean, folks make anything truth. And if everything is truth, then there's no truth. Amen. Right. It's a pretty good ploy by the devil. If everything's truth, then there really is no truth. And, and by the way, that takes away the absolute truth of Scripture. At least he thinks it does. And, and that's what's happening in the minds and hearts of a lot of folks. But they're, they're walking away. They have the facts, but facts never turn into faith. Facts can fill your head, but faith changes your heart. And honestly, if they really believed that Jesus did what He said, if they really believed He had resurrected from the dead, if they believed what others had testified, what they'd seen and what they'd heard, they never would have left Jerusalem. You couldn't have drugged them out of Jerusalem that night. There's no way these men would be going to Emmaus if they really believed that Jesus had resurrected. And yet they have all of these facts of what had happened and verifiable of that, but they have no faith. Well, I believe that's some of you today. That's some of you in this room this morning. You've got the facts. You know the facts. You know the story of Easter. You know that Jesus rose from the dead. Matter of fact, some of you are here today because it's that Resurrection Sunday. It's the day we celebrate the resurrection of Christ. You've heard the facts. You know the facts. You're here today because of the facts. But some of you are going to leave after this service with the facts but still have no faith in the facts that have been laid out. You're going to walk away from this building. You'll walk away from the cross. You'll walk away from the empty tomb. You'll walk away from a daily walk with God because you have the facts in your head, but they're not going to make any difference in your life because you don't have faith in your heart in the Lord Jesus Christ. What needs to happen to change that? I'm glad you asked that question. I'm glad you asked. You don't need any more facts. Hello? You're not doing anything with the facts you have. You don't need any more facts. What you need is Jesus to show up. (laughs) They didn't need any more facts, Jimmy. They just needed Jesus to show up. 
Jesus puts everything in perspective. And by the way, when Jesus shows up, they don't know it's him. <laughs> I, I remember when the Lord began to deal with me. I didn't, I didn't grow up in church. Um, went, went to church when I was in the military. A fellow invited me to go. I, I didn't know that the Lord had showed up and was working in my life. I just know I was uncomfortable. I know I was under conviction. I know what it is now. I didn't know what it was then. I just knew I wanted out of there. Amen? I, I, don't, I don't want to hear that. I don't want, to, I don't want that voice inside of me letting me know that I was wrong, that I wasn't where I needed to be with God. I was going to spend eternity in hell. I, I didn't like that, 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 the vo- that voice of the Holy Spirit working in my heart. I didn't know that the Lord had shown up, but He did. And I hope He shows up and begins to speak unto you today. But they don't know it's Him. But Jesus shows up. And before he lets them recognize who he is, he helps them understand what he's done. He lets them know what happened. He lets them know why it happened. And faith explodes in their heart. Verse 14, it's it's amazing. They're talking about everything that had happened. And as Jesus draws near and starts walking with them and he hears them talking about all the things that have taken place, Jesus says, what things? (laughs) You know, I, I... it, it'd sort of be like if you were in New York City on September 12th and you're walking around and everybody's just in, in turmoil and in a tizzy and, and you say, well, why is everybody acting like this? Huh? Well, because of September 11th, right? Because of 9-11. Well, well, well Jesus says, what, what things are you talking about? And they're like, man, where have you been? You don't get into town much, do you? This guy doesn't get out very often. I mean, everybody's talking about what's taking place. They took Jesus, they crucified him. Now there's a report that he's resurrected. And Jesus says, what things? Cleopas begins to respond in verse 18. One of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering, said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast not known the things which are come to pass here in these days? And he said unto them, what things? And they said unto him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, Mighty indeed in word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be cru- condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulcher. And when they found not his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels which said that he was alive, and certain of them which were with us, went to the sepulcher and found that even so, as the women had said, but him they saw not. I I, I love how Cleopas is straightening Jesus out, amen? The one who knows nothing is trying to explain to the one who knows everything, amen? Isn't that kind of how it works? I, I mean, honestly, even in the day and age we live in, it seems like the folks who don't know much or nothing are always trying to tell the folks who, who, who know what's going on. But at any rate, Jesus listens to him without interruption. Now again, they have all of the facts, but it hasn't translated into faith. And there are a lot of folks, even church folks like that today. They get the facts, but it really hasn't changed them because they don't really believe it. Listen to me. If you really believe that Jesus resurrected, and if you've really experienced resurrection power in your life, you'll be changed, you'll be transformed, you'll be different There's a supernatural element to the resurrection of Christ. There's a supernatural element to salvation. God transforms and changes people. Listen, when you see somebody who's been saved and delivered from their sin, you you, you can recognize God did something in that life. There are too many things that are far too natural that go under the guise of Christianity in the day that we live in. If you believed in the resurrection, it would transform you for Christ. Jesus didn't die and resurrect to make good people. He didn't die and resurrect to make church folks. He died and resurrected that He might save folks and sanctify them, that they might be transformed by the power of the gospel of Christ. It takes more than facts. Number two. Number two, it takes more than feelings. It takes more than facts. It takes more than feelings. In verse 21, they said, But we had trusted that it had been He which should have redeemed Israel. The word trusted is interesting. In the, in the original language in the Greek, it's the word elpizo. And it literally means hoped. We hoped. We expected. We anticipated that he was the one. We really felt like he was the one. 
Boy, down through the years, I, I have counseled with a number of folks who've used that line. Boy, we really felt like, or don't you feel like? We really felt like he was the one. And you know what they said about Jesus was true? They just came to the wrong conclusions. They're disillusioned with the real Jesus because in their mind they have created another version of Jesus. And by the way, that's where a whole lot of folks live in the day we live in. They get disillusioned with God and they get disillusioned with Jesus because they formulated in their mind a whole complete false Jesus that they, that they think is the real thing. They formulate it in their mind and that's, that, that's who they think God is. That's who they think His Son is. They're disillusioned. Notice how much past tense they use. In verse 19, they say about Jesus, He was a prophet. He was mighty in deed. As a matter of fact, He did miracles. He was mighty in word. He was a great teacher. He was, He was, He was. Verse 20, He was crucified. Verse 21, we trusted, past tense, we hoped. We thought He was the one, but He didn't do what we thought He would do. Hello? Hello? We thought he was the Messiah. We thought he was the one sent from God, but he didn't do what we thought he would do. We thought he came to redeem Israel, to rescue Israel. They thought Messiah would be a conquering king, not a suffering servant. They thought Messiah would wear a crown and not carry a cross. They thought he'd lift Israel up and not lay himself down. They thought he would dominate with military and, and political power not come to forge a kingdom through spiritual power. And in their mind, they thought this can't be the Savior because He's not doing things the way we think things ought to be done. They wanted Jesus to come and save them from the bad guys who at that particular time happened to be Rome. They didn't realize in their own heart and mind they were the bad guys Jesus needed to save them from. They themselves needed salvation from themselves. He came to save them. He came to set them free from their sins and they could never be rescued by the real Jesus until they let go of the wrong Jesus. And some of you are just like that this morning. You're never going to embrace the real Jesus until you get rid of the wrong Jesus that you've created in your own mind. You base it on feeling. Well, this is how I feel it ought to be. You can't grab the lifesaver until you let go of the anchor. They're disappointed. They're disillusioned with the Jesus they had invented. And their Jesus, He came to give them easier days. Their Jesus, He came to keep them healthy all the time. Their Jesus, He came to give them a pain-free life. Their Jesus, He came to give them a trouble-free existence. Their Jesus came that they might have no, no material worries. Their Jesus came to give them a happily ever after. But in this sin-stained, sin-tainted world that we live in, it's never going to be happily ever after. Until we get into the presence of God and sin is ultimately dealt with. It's impossible. And because things didn't work out the way they thought they should work out, they dismissed Him as Messiah. And I'm telling you, there are folks who use that argument all the time because everything isn't perfect in the world, that, that Jesus couldn't be God, He couldn't be Messiah. I mean, because, because in my mind, the way I feel, that, that this isn't how God should act and how God should work. Well, what do you base that on? I mean, how many universes have you spoken into existence? What have you ever created? It's not the way I see it. Their problem was they, they, they just felt wrong. They thought. We thought he was the one. But obviously he couldn't be the one because he's not doing it the way I'd do it. He's not doing it the way I wanted it done. And so they're disillusioned. And they're blaming the Lord for their imperfect life. And so they walk away. And they're walking away because the real Jesus hasn't captured their heart. The real Jesus isn't Lord of their life. The real Jesus isn't who they're, who they're looking to and trusting in. So Jesus listens while they explain how they feel. And then Jesus begins to work. And look, number three, notice number three. It's more than facts, it's more than feelings. But number three, you must have faith. You must have faith. You can know the facts but not believe them. Look in verse 25. Then he, this is Jesus, said unto them, and I'll tell you how you can know it was Jesus. The red letters, amen? They always give it away, don't they? The red letters. 
Jesus says, O oh, fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. He began to go through the Old Testament scriptures and he takes them on this, on this tour of all of the shadows of the substance of himself. And no doubt he begins in Moses, and of course the first five books are, are the books of Moses, the Pentateuch, and, 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 and you certainly have in, in, in the book of Genesis, uh, uh, right from the get-go in chapter 3, you have a, 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 at least some allusion unto Jesus Christ. The fact that, uh, that he would be Messiah who ultimately would, would crush the devil's head even though the devil might bruise his heel. I'm sure he took him up onto Mount Moriah with Abraham and his son. And he talked about how, how that ram that was caught in the thicket, it portrayed the, the Lamb of God that would one day come and take away the sins of the world. And you know the story. Abraham is called by God to go and sacrifice his son. God never intended for him to sacrifice his son. It's a test. The Bible tells us it's a test. Didn't tell Abraham it was a test, but it's a test. Matter of fact, he communicates, I, I, I know that you love me with all of your heart now. Because he was willing to give his son unto God. God stayed his hand. But it was also, also a picture that one day God would give his son. Because that's how much he loves you. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. <laughs> you walk a little bit further into the book of Exodus. You find when the children of Israel were, were enslaved in, in Egyptian bondage. As they began to cry out unto God, God sent Moses and Aaron. They were to be the spokesmen, spokespersons for God to set His people free. And, and as they go and begin to negotiate and deal with, uh, with Pharaoh, Pharaoh continues to harden his heart. And so God begins through a series of plagues to, to soften the heart of Pharaoh, to, uh, to set the stage. And, and ultimately the final plague that allows Pharaoh to let God's people go is the death of the firstborn son. He tells all the Israelites, listen, you need to take a lamb. You need to slay that lamb, take the blood of that lamb, apply it, paint it on the doorpost of your home. Because the death angel is coming through tonight. And wherever the blood has been applied to that household, when the death angel sees the blood, the wrath of God's going to pass over. Man, I love Passover, by the way. Amen. It's going to pass over. Aren't you grateful? He's going to pass over one day. I'm grateful the blood's been applied unto my life, the blood of the Lamb of God. The one day when I stand before God, the wrath of God's going to pass over. It's not going to fall upon me because Jesus spared me from it. And so they do that. They apply the blood. The death angel comes through and, and in the Israelites' houses where the blood had been applied, none of the Israelites died. None of the firstborn sons died. But in every Egyptian home they did. And again, it was a picture that one day the Lamb of God is going to come. He'll take away the sins of the world. He'll take care of the wrath of God. You and I won't have to stand it ourselves because Jesus took it for us. But it wasn't just about the physical agony that Jesus suffered on the cross. It was about the reality that at one point God turned His back upon the Son. That separation that took place, the wrath of God was poured out upon the Son. He took it on the cross that day. So he begins to walk, him through the old, walk them through the Old Testament. He gets to Isaiah chapter 3. All we like sheep have turned away. We have turned everyone to our own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we're healed. And Jesus is telling them, that's me. I'm the one who came to take your sins away. And all of a sudden as they're walking down that road and Jesus is sharing the word of God with them, the facts suddenly they begin, to, they, they begin to merge together and mesh together and they begin to see beyond the facts. They begin to see the Christ. They begin to recognize that Jesus is exactly who He said He was. And that faith, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. They finally put their faith and their trust in Jesus can I tell you, there's a difference in hearing and believing. And I'm telling you today, the, the world is ate up with folks that hear. But there's a difference in believing. It's not just what you know. It's what you put your faith and trust in. 
And I'm, I'm about through. Give me a few more minutes. Everybody in here lives by faith. And if you say you don't live by faith, you, you, you're just being dishonest. You're being disingenuous. Everybody lives by faith. It just depends on what your faith is in. If your faith isn't in Jesus Christ, you have settled for something that is not verifiable and validatable. You've settled for something less than what God intended. Jesus is looking for folks who will not just get stuck in the facts and not just get stuck in their own feelings, but will literally believe what God said in His truth, what God said in His Word, and embrace Jesus Christ as the Savior of mankind, as the Lord of lords and King of kings. They'll allow Him to, to, to wipe away and wash away their sins, but also to be their Lord and Savior. If you'll let Jesus Christ be Lord and Savior of your life, He'll transform and change you all across this building. There are folks whose lives have been transformed changed going in one direction and they had this encounter with Jesus Christ Jesus showed up and began to speak and when he moved upon their hearts they responded with yes Lord I will they turned from their sins and trusted him and when they did Jesus made a dramatic difference he's trying to do the same for you today the resurrection it means nothing to you if all it is is a fact it means nothing unto you if you don't do something with it in faith. Jesus came to set us free. By the way, when they really got a hold of who Jesus was and what Jesus did and put their faith in Him, they made a beeline back to Jerusalem because they wanted to see what God was doing and wanted to be involved in what God was doing. They wanted to share what the Lord had done in their life as well. Jesus is trying to do a work in your life. And the only one that hinders you from allowing Him to do it is you. He's working. He's moving. He's looking for you to say yes. Let's bow for prayer. Father, I pray in these few moments that you really would zero in on hearts. Lord, there are some today some, Lord, that are wandering some that are drifting, some that are straying, Lord. They know who you are. And yet, Lord, some things have happened in life that have dissuaded them, caused them to become disillusioned. And Lord, they're not where they ought to be in their walk with you. And Lord, just as you went after these two that were on the road to Emmaus, Lord, you're hot on their trail today. Lord, you're trying to draw them back, to bring them back unto you. Father, I pray they'd hear your voice. Lord Jesus, I pray that understand and recognize what you're trying to do. Lord, you've never done anything but love them. You've never had anything but their best at heart. God, I pray they'd listen to your voice and turn back unto you. Lord, there are some today that need to turn to you for the very first time. Lord, where they are right now, they're lost. They're condemned already. Lord, they're at enmity with you. They're on the outside looking in. And Lord, they're on the outside looking in because they've never acknowledged the great gift the Father has given unto mankind. They've never surrendered their will unto your will. They've never turned from their sins and trusted you. They've never acknowledged, Lord, what you did for them. You know how I pray today, Lord, those facts. Lord, I pray they'd become faith today. Lord, only you can do that. Lord, only you can take what, what we know in our mind and translate it into our heart. Father, I pray they'd respond unto your voice as you, as you beckon, as you tug, as you pull today. Lord, you've given every one of us a free will. We can choose as you draw. So, Father, I pray you'd speak. Lord, there's some folk today that are hurting. God, I'm thankful for that resurrection power. I'm grateful, Lord, that you're able to take every circumstance and every situation. And Lord, it may not work out the way we think it ought to work out, but God, you can use it ultimately for our good and for your glory. God, I pray you just give us faith to trust you. And so in these next few moments, Lord, I pray as you speak, we'd be obedient children unto you. We give you this time, Lord, use it for your glory. And we'll praise you for what you do. We pray it in Jesus' name, amen. Stand with me if you will. This morning as God speaks, there's an altar available for you. There's some chairs up front. But as He speaks unto you, would you slip out and come?
Preacher, I've been wandering. I've been walking away. I, I'm not where I need to be in my walk with the Lord. There was a time when I was close unto Him. There was a time when I was sold out and on fire, but I'm not there now. Oh, He's beckoning. He's calling you. He's inviting you back unto Him. He's pursuing you. The Good Shepherd is looking for you today. Do you need to come? Maybe this morning, so preacher, I, I, I never have been saved. I never give my heart unto the Lord. I, I don't even know where to begin. Well, listen, you come. Someone will show you how you can be saved. They'll walk you through the Word of God. You can leave today knowing everything is right between you and the Lord, knowing that the resurrection has meaning in your life. Whatever your need is, while we begin to sing, you slip out and come. Come on right now. Oh, to Jesus I it's more than facts today a lot of you folks you've got the facts in your head but you don't have faith in your heart do you need to come do you really believe he resurrected for you do you really believe he died on the cross for you do you need to come he gives an invitation it's open it's an opportunity this heads bowed eyes closed we're supposed to be ready to give an answer to every man of the hope that's within us this morning if you know the Lord if you've been saved if you know things are right between you and the Lord as a testimony to the work of God in your life would you just slip your hand up and hold it up this morning God bless your hands all across the building that is resurrection power Jesus did that for you you can put them down now please heads bowed eyes closed nobody looking around you say, this morning, I, 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 I'm not right with the Lord. I'm not where I need to be with God. But I, I really want to know that you're praying for me. If, if you're here like that this morning, and you're just not sure things are right between you and the Lord, but you want to know that somebody's praying, I, I promise I am not going to embarrass you. I am not going to come to you. I'm not going to call you by name. But I promise I'll pray for you. And I promise there are a bunch of other folk here. They may not even know who you are, but they know. They know somebody needs prayer. They're not looking around, but they know somebody needs prayer. If that's you, you need prayer this morning. Would you slip that hand up, up and down real quick? God bless you. God bless you. Several others. God bless you. Numbers of hands this morning. God bless you. Well, God's trying to do a work in your life. He's giving grace right now. Father, I pray for those hands that have been raised. Lord, I know how much you love them. And Lord, you are trying to do a work in their life. Lord, I, I know, I, I know that sometimes we feel like that, Lord, there's, there's nothing you can do. We have made such a mess and things are so difficult and my circumstance is so unique. Lord, you're able to change any circumstance. You're able to transform any situation. Lord, you can work in any life, in any heart. And so I pray right now, Lord, you'd help those folks to respond in faith. Father, I pray you'd help them to move and surrender unto you today. Lord, I pray you'd just heap grace upon grace in their life. Help them to know how much you love them and what you have in store for them. And God, may they respond unto you, we pray. We're going to sing another verse. One more verse. If God's speaking, slip out and come. I, I beg you this morning, please, as he's speaking to you, you come. We're going to sing one last verse. And if God's dealing with you, come on. You can leave today. Everything can be right between you and the Lord. You come on. Oh, to Jesus, I surrender. Grab the hand of that person next to you. Tell them, come on with me. They'll come. Come on right now. He's knocking. He's wanting to do a work. Come on. says I love you I want to do a work in your life will you come He 
need to come. Oh, don't miss this opportunity. God's knocking, God's speaking. Do you need to come? He's knocking on your heart's door. Oh, what a work he'll do in your life. Will you let him? Come on, right now, folks are praying for you. One more verse, last verse. Do you need to come? knocking on your heart's door. Come on, right now. Musicians continue to play. I'm going to ask you to be seated. Heads bowed, eyes closed, Christians praying. Still an opportunity to come. He's trying to do his work. Come on. Come on right now. You're already here. He's speaking to your heart. opportunity they need to come one of the most foolish things I ever did was when I went to church and God spoke to my heart I white knuckled the pew in front of me and I got out of there I didn't listen to his convicting voice. I didn't listen to the convincing of the Holy Spirit. I thought if I could just get out of there. Can I tell you something? It's not going to get any better. If he's on your trail, if he's pursuing you, he's going with you when you leave here. He's not just in this place. He's trying to do what is ultimately best for you. Will you come? But when I finally surrendered my life to the Lord, I thought, what in the world was I doing? What was I doing? Do you need to come? Some of you got the facts. Do you really have faith? Facts will bring you to church on Sunday, but faith will change the way you live your life. Do you need to come?
I appreciate your patience this morning. Thank you for being here. And uh, you pray for those who've, who've made decisions for the Lord today. And it's still not too late. If you need to talk to somebody, I'll be around after the service. And, and uh, still an opportunity to make sure you get things right. Let, let me just mention a couple things real quick as we go. Uh, next Sunday we'll have Impact Sunday. Brother Roger Lucas is going to be here. I think we're going to have you guys with us Sunday night as well. Is that right? And, uh, and the young folks, Miss Christie, they're going to be singing. Is that right? Oh, but you, you need to hear. There's, there's a bass singer extraordinaire right there. Uh, you need to hear these young folks sing. Uh, Jason, you going to sing with them? Thank you. I, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, no, they, they do phenomenal. And uh, uh, they're going to be singing with us Sunday night. And uh, uh, Brother Roger will be here, of course, both services. Uh, I'm sorry we, we took your preacher from you this, this next Sunday, but uh, uh, Brother Roger, great, great guy, great man. And so uh, we are going to be having a fellowship time Sunday night after the service. And so if you will, uh, bring your favorite finger foods and dessert. There's a sign-up list on the information table. Uh, just just kind of let us know what you're planning on bringing. Sign that list, put it on that table over there and, or, or on that uh, sheet over on the table, and that way we'll kind of have an idea. Tonight, um, we're going to do drop-in communion. Now, that may not, you may not understand what that is. Uh, between the hours of 5 and 7, I'll be over in the, in the other sanctuary, and I'll have communion set up. Uh, when you come in, there will probably be some folks in there already waiting. I, I, I deal with folks either individually or as a family or as multiple families, just any way you want to do it. If you want to come up in a, as a gang, you can do that. Uh, but but, but I, just, I, I just like to pray with folks and serve communion and to just remember what the Lord did for us. That's what communion is all about. Uh, this do in remembrance of me. And uh, so we're, we're going to be doing that this evening between 5 and 7. You won't be here from 5 to 7. It's just drop in sometime between then. And after, after you've been served communion, you're, you're, you're free to leave. And you're welcome to stay if you like. But, uh, but I hope that uh, you'll partake of that. Uh, and, and just wanted to, to sort of give some clarity about that. Amen? All right. Now, your young people are probably ready for you to pick them up. But I know the people who are working with your young people are ready for you to pick them up. <laughs> Amen. Let's stand together. We're going to be dismissed in prayer. Brother Jeremy, it is good to see you today, brother. I, I know you had some good news and things going well for you and glad to have you back with us. Brother Jeremy, if you will, would you dismiss us in prayer, please?